Good day, everyone. Today, we will be talking about laboratory safety, specifically in the context of the clinical laboratory. Let's have a short recap on the different types of hazards identified by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. These are biological hazards, chemical hazards, physical hazards, ergonomic hazards, safety hazards, and finally, work organization hazards. Now, these hazards can be found in almost any setting. However, for this lesson, we will be talking about them specifically in the context of the clinical laboratory. First, let's talk about biological or biologic hazards. These are hazards that are caused by living organisms and are probably the most common and significant hazards that we encounter in the laboratory. This is because we often encounter or handle blood products and other body fluids in the clinical laboratory. However, we should not limit ourselves to thinking that biological hazards only come from our human samples because they can actually come from a variety of living organisms that include fungi, bacteria, viruses, animals, insects, and sometimes even from plants. Now, whenever we encounter these biological hazards or whenever we handle biological hazards, the Occupational Safety Health Administration, or OSHA, mandates that all laboratory workers must observe universal precautions. And this means that whenever we handle biological hazards, we have to treat them as potentially infectious. Let's now talk about the chain of infection. This is an epidemiological principle that explains how infection is passed from one person or from one organism to another. Traditionally, it is composed of three components, the source, the host, and the mode of transmission. Here is a diagram of our biohazard symbol. So as you can see, it is composed of three circles, and these indicate the three components of our chain of infection. So the source, the host, and the mode of transmission. Now, in order to stop infection, we have to break the chain of infection. And this is indicated by the gaps you can see on the circles in the biohazard symbol. The most common and probably best way to break the chain of infection is through the use of hand washing. So, in the laboratory, it is recommended that we should vigorously wash our hands for at least 20 seconds in order to disinfect or minimize the transmission of disease. So, instead of counting 20 seconds, you can also sing the happy birthday song twice. Next, let's talk about sharps. Now, sharps are one of the leading causes or most significant causes of biological hazards in the clinical laboratory. And in fact, finger pricks or needle pricks are the most common injury that you encounter in the lab. Examples of sharps are broken or other sharp glass, sharp or broken plastic, razor blades or scalpels, needles, and other sharp metals. In order to avoid sharp injuries, we can practice the following precautions. First and most important, do not throw sharps away with the regular trash. Sometimes when we do this, it's possible that our waste disposal personnel might not know that there are needles in the trash and might not practice the proper precautions in collecting our trash, resulting in finger pricks. Next, dispose sharps in a properly labeled sharps container. Now, the sharps container must have the following characteristics. First, they must be puncture-proof. Next, they have to be properly labeled, and they have to be labeled with the word sharps to let everyone know that there are sharps inside the container. They must also have the biohazard symbol and must have a cover to prevent spillage of contents. And ideally, they should not be made of fragile materials like your glass. Sometimes, these sharps containers have grooves to facilitate the ease of needle removal. And that leads us to the next uh, precaution that we have, which is to never recap our needles. Ideally, once we use a needle, we should immediately dispose of it in the sharps container. If you need to recap a needle, you can do so by fishing out the needle or by using a machine to mechanically recap the needle. So we've talked about how to dispose our sharps. How about disposing of our different biological waste? So the first thing to do would be to place them in appropriate containers labeled with the biohazard symbol. 
After this, you can then refer to local waste disposal regulations as to how you can safely dispose of your waste. Some uh, law enforcement agencies prefer that you incinerate your waste on site. You can also um, outsource these wastes to various companies and those companies can make sure that the biological hazards can safely be disposed. Another way we can protect ourselves from biological hazards is through the use of personal protective equipment or PPEs. And these include but are not limited to gloves, fluid resistant lab gowns, masks, and sometimes even goggles or face shields. Next, let's talk about chemical hazards. So in the clinical laboratory, we still often encounter chemical hazards because of the reagents that we use. So these reagents can contain compounds that might be considered as chemical hazards. So these compounds are chemical hazards if they have one or more of the following characteristics. Uh, they may either be flammable, explosive, toxic or poisonous, corrosive, or they can be an irritant or even an environmental hazard. Most chemical hazards actually have symbols indicating that they are dangerous. So usually you can find these on the container of your chemical hazards. So they may have one or more of the following symbols. This is the symbol for an explosive substance. If your substance is an oxidizer or a strong oxidizer rather, then you have a flammable substance and a toxic and poisonous substance. You also have chemical hazard symbols for harmful substances or irritants. And this is the one for your corrosive substances. And finally, this is the one for your environmental hazard. Next, let's talk about some rules for proper handling of chemicals. So first and foremost, you should wear your proper PPE when handling your different chemicals. And if you have a fume hood, you should always use it whenever possible. This is especially true if you are using chemicals that produce a lot of vapors. So if you don't have a fume hood, at least handle your chemicals in a well-ventilated area to minimize the risk. Next, when mixing our chemicals, always add acid to water and not the other way around. So this rule just helps prevent any splashes from occurring and minimizes the risk of us hurting ourselves. And finally, of course, never mouth pipe it. Now, in cases of chemical spills, what should you do? The first thing that you should always do is to follow the chemical hygiene plan. Now, each institution should have a chemical hygiene plan in place. So before you handle any chemical, you have to be familiar with this plan. If you spilled chemicals on your skin, for example, you have to flush it with running water for at least 15 minutes before seeking any medical attention. So what are some things that you can use to flush the area with running water? So this is an example of an eye wash. And here we have an emergency shower that you can use whenever you spill chemicals on yourselves. Now, aside from the symbols we encountered earlier, you can also find a variety of other chemical labels in the laboratory. So here's the first one. This is called the National Fire Protection Association or NFPA hazardous material symbol. It's actually a diamond with four smaller diamonds uh, inside it. Okay, so each diamond corresponds to a different hazardous material classification. So first the top diamond indicates the fire hazard classification of the compound. Then the one on the right is the reactivity classification. The bottom diamond is your specific hazard classification. And finally on the left you have your health hazard classification. So the numbers here or the symbols indicate what hazard or what classification your compound is. So this can differ from one chemical to another. You will also probably encounter a material safety data sheet whenever you handle chemicals. So this is included in each chemical and it's advised that before you handle that chemical, you are supposed to read the material safety data sheet. So think of this as a more thorough NFPA diamond. So it contains the physical and chemical characteristics of your chemical, fire and explosion potential, reactivity potential, health hazards and emergency first aid procedures when handling the chemical, methods for safe handling and disposal, primary routes of entry, and finally, exposure limits and carcinogenic potential of the chemical hazard. Next, let's talk about our physical hazards. 
So in contrast to our chemical or biological hazards, physical hazards are environmental factors that can cause harm without necessarily having contact with an individual. So some examples of physical hazards are temperature extremes, so either extreme hot temperatures or extreme low temperatures, radiation, and this includes your ionizing and non-ionizing radiation. Examples of ionizing radiation are your x-rays, and for your non-ionizing radiations, these include microwaves. Then also another example here is constant loud noise. So if you are constantly exposed to loud noise, this can lead to detrimental effects to your hearing, and therefore it's considered to be a physical hazard. Next, we have ergonomic hazards. So these are hazards that can result from long-term exposure to work, body positions, and working conditions that put strain on the body and result in long-term illnesses. So sometimes uh, when we do a task, you'll notice that you might feel a bit of pain or after you do the task, you feel a bit of soreness on your body. And that can be an example of an ergonomic hazard. So although you don't feel the detrimental effects right now, later on you might develop conditions that are more serious, such as chronic back pain or carpal tunnel syndrome. So here we have examples of tasks or situations that might be ergonomic hazards. Some of the examples we have are improperly adjusted workstations and chairs. So sometimes when your table is too high or your chair is too low, this can actually cause you problems later on. Frequent lifting, especially if you're lifting heavy objects or if you're lifting objects using the wrong technique. Next, we have poor posture, and you also have awkward movements and even repeating the same movements over and over. So some examples of this would be your pipetting. And even strong vibrations can also be ergonomic hazards. Second to the last, we have our safety hazards. This is the most common hazard in any workplace. You can encounter these not only in the hospital laboratory, but even on the hospital grounds or in the hospital hallways. It's any unsafe condition that can cause injury, illness, and death. Some examples we have here are electrical hazards. So if you have exposed wiring or if you have a plug somewhere that is touching liquid, that can be a source of an electrical hazard. If you are working from heights, so if you're on a ladder or if you're standing on top of a table, that can also be a hazard to you. Spills and tripping hazards, so water on the ground or maybe um, various debris that can cause you to trip, and even unguarded machinery and moving machine parts. So the last one here, this is especially true for big automated laboratories where we have big machines that have a lot of moving parts. These can actually hurt you if you're not very careful. Lastly, we have our work organization hazards. So these are hazards or stressors that can cause stress or short-term effects and strain, otherwise known as long-term effects, on employees or individuals. And these can affect our mental health more than they affect our physical health. So some examples we have here are increased workload demands or increased intensity and or pace of work. So if you're feeling overworked, that's also a hazard for you. If you feel like you are lacking flexibility or control in your work, or if you feel that you lack social support or relations, that can also have detrimental effects to you. If you are experiencing harassment, and especially if you are experiencing workplace violence, then that can be a very big work organization hazard. Okay, so that ends our discussion for today. If you wanted to learn more about the things we just discussed, you can check out these references right here. So thank you everyone for listening and have a good day.